Thank you, uh, uh, Anshul. So um, I, I should uh, give that as a brief preamble. Uh, I think earlier this afternoon, Andrea said that he would be a good moderator for his session because he had no conflicting uh, information. I'm uh, highly conflicted in this topic, so I'm just ad admitting that ahead of time. But because I think the Centers for Mendelian Genomics have proved to be such a rich source of information about our genes and genomes, I couldn't help, and they fit so well to the topic title, I couldn't help but put this in my first slide, actually my first two slides. So the goal here, I think, is uh, identifying um, a phenotype for every gene in the genome. And it takes advantage, uh, this approach takes advantage, that is the Centers for Mendelian Genomics, takes advantage of the natural saturation mutagenesis that Andy Clark uh, mentioned earlier today. And uh, recall that I said yesterday that only 20% of uh, human genes are currently tagged with a phenotype, so we're far from complete in this effort. And uh, progress, I won't show you the data slides, but progress shows uh, over the last seven years shows, shows no sign of hitting an as asymptote. The curve's going uh, straight up. Uh, moreover, this project harvests information, which we've heard about uh, in previous comments, in allelic series. So it's, this is not all human uh, null alleles, but a rich source of different kinds of uh, human alleles. And uh, the results inform clinical practice and basic research very quickly. Um, and the CMGs have built a collection of tools and made them freely available to the genetics community. So in a way, this is a force multiplier for other people who are, do not have CMG funding but use these tools to promote their own efforts to find uh, uh, Mendelian disease genes. Now, there are areas, lots of areas to improve, and some of them I've listed here. Uh, if we want to find a phenotype for every gene in the genome, we have to sample the population across the world, I would argue. And that means uh, a robust sub subject recruitment and increasingly online resources and tools to do this. Perhaps there are others. Uh, variant discovery. We, all the CMGs have analyzed families that look flat out Mendelian and are not able to find the answer. So the question is, what are we missing? Is this somewhere else in the genome? Is it a kind of variation that we're just overlooking? Recall that we didn't pay much attention to copy number variants until 2004, a big source of variation. Um, so I don't know what the answer will be. I think it's likely to turn up very shortly. Um, uh, and then an, an era, another challenge is variant interpretation. And for this, we need uh, additional tools of the type we've heard about from many uh, at this podium, expanded access to reference data, human data, and model organism data, a uh, robust set of model systems, cellular and organismal for functional studies, expanded atlases of phenotypic consequences at levels of the gene more proximal than the clinical phenotype, that is, moving into uh, the metabolome, the RNA, the proteome, and so forth. So those are all things that would, uh, uh, goals that would uh, accentuate the progress of the CMGs, I believe. Now, there's a special area that's sort of related to the CMGs, but also touches to, on the CCDGs. So I, I argue that it's worth special emphasis, um, and, it, it, and that is to explore the interface between Mendelian uh, traits and complex traits. And it's a goal that's slightly tangential to the main goals of those two programs, and so I think it needs to be emphasized a little bit because otherwise we have to sort of turn our attention a little bit away from the main goal to focus on this. There are many poss possibilities, all, I think, from a genetics point of view, uh, extremely interesting modifiers, epistasis, oligogenic, and so forth and so on. Uh, we need more sequence and better tools to analyze to, to get at this, I think. And uh, we want to ask what phenotypic patterns, are there patterns of phenotypes that are more likely to be regulatory variants versus coding variants? And I should also point out that the coding variants help establish uh, which regulatory mutations uh, connect to which genes. Now the last uh, uh, aim, I think, or idea we should think about is a simple question, why does evolution care about this gene? So there is this conundrum of genes uh, that appear to be conserved, but when they are disrupted in one way or another, a lack apparent phenotypes. 
So I don't think a, a gene is sitting there just by accident. I think we're just not looking at the phenotype in an uh, adequate way. And I would argue that we need to develop uh, standard sets of both environmental and genetic stresses that expose phenotypes and build these stresses into our functional testing protocols. If in the clinic, I can tell you that we see over and over again kids and adults who have genetic disorders and they are made worse by some stress that that child encounters, either an infection or uh, perhaps uh, they have a second hit in their genome and so forth. And I give a couple examples of genic stress, uh, Susan Lindquist's work on HSP90 and environmental stresses, infectious and nutritional. I think the infectional infection area is a big one because I think there are a lot of genes in our genome uh, that uh, support resistance to certain kinds of infections and we don't have a way to very rigorously test, that, uh, search for those phenotypes. Those, those are my suggestions.